Good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. And um, we're going to be looking at um, a book. We're going to be looking at lots of things, and I'm not sure how far we're going to get. Uh, but 1888 re-examined some of the things about this book uh, that we talked about in the other studies uh, on Friday night. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? A dear, gracious Heavenly Father, we invite your presence here on this Sabbath. We ask that your, your Holy Spirit can fill our hearts, that your angels can watch over us, our homes, our families. We entrust all things to you, Lord. We know that we are here as ambassadors on this earth. And we yield to your government and help us help lift us above the cares of this world so that we can behold you. Be with us now, and we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so, um, just changing, I think there's some background noise there, I'm not sure. Is there any background noise? No. Okay. So we've been studying uh, the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. And we spent a lot of time in these studies going through the material of, of A.T. Jones from his General Conference Bulletins, 1893 and 1895 General Conference Bulletins. And... Um, we did that first. I mean, we looked at some of the history initially, but now we're looking back at the history. And really what we're looking at is the controversy regarding 1888 as um, it was understood by our church presently, and especially since uh, the 1980s. So the basic premise or idea uh, that we have is that, as Seventh-day Adventists, is that the church what accepted the message of righteousness by faith that A.T. AT Jones and E.J. Wagner gave in the late 1980s, or 1880s, pardon me, so in 1888, that initially it was resisted, but eventually our leadership, our ministers, our church accepted this message of righteousness by faith. Now, Part of the problem there is, well, it's it's a rather complicated problem. So let's just go back a little bit. So in 1888, Jones and Wagner give this message, and we know that they are treated very poorly. There's all kinds of, of prejudice against them, partly because of their age, but also because what they're presenting appears to be something that was not being taught. Now, sometimes this is just... Um, a perspective that the Jones and Wagner's tried to present to sort of awaken people to a reality that they didn't understand about righteousness by faith. And part of it was that the church had, the ministers had interpreted certain verses in a way, um, dealing in, especially in Galatians, the law in Galatians, because of their debating. So they had taken a stance on the law in Galatians, that it was the ceremonial law. So the ceremonial law is nailed to a cross, all that things, all those things, it's done away. And, and so this seemed to be undermining some of their arguments regarding uh, the perpetuity of the Ten Commandments. But we know it's much more complicated than that. There's personalities involved. Uh, there's people who are really resistant to the truth, that is because they're, they're not converted and they have no interest in being converted. They're just, their interest is to be in a church and um, uh, to be important. So uh, the church is very worldly. If you read uh, Fifth Testimonies that's dealing with that history prior to 1888, the church is in very bad shape spiritually. And so it's in this environment that God gives a message 
to his people. Now we know that the first and second angel's messages have been rejected. Right? The church has come Laodicean, uh, the prophetic message, uh, the 2520, the foundation of this move of this movement of Seventh-day Adventism, uh, is really just neglected and set aside. And there isn't really a searching for light and truth and understanding. Um, and so this message comes at that time. Now, the resistance then uh, that occurs ends up affecting Jones and Wagner. So Jones and Wagner are going to be, you know, Wagner's going to fall away morally. And Jones is not going to have a moral fall. His is more... Uh, like in the normal sense of some sin, uh, but he has a type of rebellion against what's happening. He starts to push back at how he's being treated. And part of it is discouragement because he believes that, that the Sunday law is coming soon, that Christ is coming soon. And yet this message continues to be despised uh, by the church. Now, after the death of Ellen White, we have people like um, A.G. Daniels, who, who claims that he accepts this message. Many people claim to accept it, um, but just because somebody says they accept something doesn't mean that they have. That is, the message becomes redefined. Now, we have the 1888 Message Study Committee. They have, um, uh, in the 1850s, or 1950s, they, they're part of this study committee um, to look at 1888, and they, in a sense, are um, they give a minority report of what they think happened. So they're going to re-examine this. And, uh, and then in 1988, they're going to republish this. It's revised and enlarged, and that's what we're going to look at. Now, this is probably going to take a bit of time, but I think it's important to understand what happens in the 1980s and through the 1990s and why the church is in its present state spiritually. Now, and if we can think about it, we know November 9th, 1989 is the time of the end for this, for this history, for the time that we are in. That's the time of the end. And you can see that this is being presented just prior to it. So the message of 1888, the third angel's message, is being presented again in some way. It's being examined or studied. Um, but again, it's going to be rejected. So, and it, it's not just rejected by the church. I would say to a large degree that the people who are promoting righteousness by faith are rejecting the message. That is, we're in the same situation that they were prior to 1888. That is, we have a debating spirit uh, that exists within conservative Adventism. Uh, we have things like Hope International, in organizations like Hope International with um, Ron Spear that definitely are uh, uh, combative, right, in how they are promoting what they see as the truths of Adventism, and many times they are. But because they have put themselves in this debating sort of stance, they actually take positions that are incorrect. So, so it's not a simple thing to sort through. I think people individually have to go through and read um, all of this material. And when I say all of it, I think we have to read all of it. It is we need to read Ellen White's uh, writings on 1888. So the 1888, whatever the book is called, um, manuscripts, 1888 manuscripts of Ellen White. We need to read books like this by Robert Whelan and Donald Short and, and other books, too, that address this issue. We need to study it uh, carefully and prayerfully. Also, we need to read Jones and Wagner's books for ourselves um, and, and prayerfully and carefully consider the things they say. And we know that errors, yeah, the 1888 materials by Ellen G. White, Angela typed in. So we know that, um, you know, Wagner went off into to pantheism. Jones never did, though 
he sympathized with with Kellogg and how Kellogg was being treated. Um, but Jones went uh, took some extreme views regarding uh, the Sunday Law, and also uh, had problems with the spirit of prophecy for a time, uh, believing that she had been influenced. So all of these things uh, need to be examined. We need to understand the issues. We need to understand them for ourselves. And these studies here are helping us look at these materials. But you need to study them. You need to read them. Um, now, it takes, takes a lot of time. Um, and for me personally, I mean, I, I started studying Jones and Wagner's material probably in 80, probably be 84, I think. Um, so a couple of years after I became an Adventist, that I started looking at these issues anyway. So we had at least by 85. And, um, and that's when we started the Upper Room Bible Studies. Um, so on April uh, 19th, 1985, we had our first Upper Room Bible Studies in, in my home. I guess it was April 20th. So my son was born April 19th, the night before the studies. Um, so anyway, uh, that's how I remember the date. Um, so at that time, you know, we began studying, uh, righteousness by faith. And slowly I began reading these books over time and seeing these things acted out. So we could see what was happening within Adventism. I mean, I was reading, um, the Standish Brothers books and lots of other books at that time and trying to understand what really the issue was and what the experience of righteousness by faith was. So here we're going to look at, at Robert Wheelan's and Donald Short's uh, book, 1888 Reexamined. Now they both write some other really good books to read. One is In Search of the Cross by Wheelan. I recommend that book to anybody. And the other is... Um, even though it has some problems with it, the Donald K. Short's book on Then Shall the Sanctuary Be Cleansed. And, and both of these books are important books for Adventists to read. Um, also recommend if you're going to read a Wagner book, uh, Christ Our Righteousness, and if you're going to read an A.T. Jones book, The Consecrated Way to Christian Perfection, even though it has some, some errors in it regarding the daily. So... Um, so Christ, what, what happens with uh, Christ's heavenly ministry, you can see some of those in, influences on the new view of the daily in that book. Okay, so there's a little bit of stuff here that I'm just going to skip. Uh, but I think I should read this preface. So we're going to start here. And of course, if anybody has comments or questions or observations, uh, feel free uh, to make those comments. So uh, it says the authors hold the firm conviction that God has entrusted to Seventh-day Adventists his last message of more abounding grace for humanity. This message must supply a final cure for the problem of sin, demonstrate righteousness in believing humanity, and vindicate the sacrifice of Christ. Nothing can enter the kingdom of heaven that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. The authors also believe that the Savior has an immeasurable longing for his people to prepare the way for his return. The message the Lord sent this people in 1888 was intended to complete his work of grace in human hearts so that the great controversy could be brought to an end. But something went wrong a century ago. The Lord's plan was frustrated and delayed. What happened? Why this long delay? Now, I don't believe that that um, Wieland and Short really understand what happened, right? So they're, when I was studying this back in the 1980s and in the 90s, trying to understand this issue, I came to a bit of a different conclusion than they did. Um, because they tend to look at what was happening as far as the rejection of the message by um, the leadership and uh, not really why the, why the message didn't accomplish its task 
why the leadership didn't accept it. We understand now that the first and second angels' messages were rejected. So they don't have that perspective that we have. The beacon lights of a century ago have grown dim and in many cases have flickered and gone out. The hallmarks of Adventism have become tarnished. Our people have not verbally abandoned confidence in the second coming of Christ, but the expectation of his near return has faded. Many are bewildered and confused. The present world entices to fashion, amusements, and me-first luxury. So you can see, of course, the me-first era of the 80s. Even in enlightened Seventh-day Adventist communities with a rich historical heritage, divorce has become almost epidemic. Social drinking is a problem in our colleges and universities and in too many of our homes. Most Seventh-day Adventists in North America have no clear concept of a heavenly day of atonement or of our unique duty to, of temperance and self-control in relation to it. It is amazing that in a time of exploding human knowledge, we as a people generally still have only a vague concept of what Christ is doing as high priest in this final day of atonement and scant sympathy with his aims. And what we do not understand, we cannot communicate to the world. Now, this is why uh, Short's book on um, Then Shall the Sanctuary Be Cleansed is quite, quite important. He brings up some extremely good points. And, and one of the things that we would see in... Uh, conservative Adventists in the 1980s and 90s is this idea that Christ has to complete a work in his people as a vindication of what Christ did at the cross. And this idea is labeled today as last generation theology. Uh, it's seen as an enemy of the church, uh, of the truth by uh, the organized church. They don't really accept last generation theology. Um, even amongst cons some conservative Adventists. So, and part of the problem is the way that this message that Jones and Wagner's presented and the scriptures have presented has been distorted. It is well known that a large portion of our youth lack clear cut convictions of Seventh day Adventist identity. The series in the Adventist Review of June 1986 recognizes a new phenomenon. Adventist youth are joining Sunday keeping churches. Now, when we think about this, I mean, 1986, well, that's quite a while ago, right? It's nearly 40 years ago. So we're looking at like, you know, 37 years ago. It's a long time ago. Um, and those youth who were leaving and going to Sunday keeping churches, obviously, they're no longer Seventh day Adventists. But we also know that many youth stayed in the church and now are leaders, pastors, um, and have other roles within the church. Some of them, it's just that they're part of the institutions. They grew up as Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, they became doctors, nurses. They work in our institutions, teachers. And those people those that have not understood the Seventh-day Adventist message continue to now to lead our church. And there are some who believe the truth, at least on different levels, but we can see that what happened in the 1980s definitely has affected the way the church is today. And so we have a message that is connected to the message, the third angel's message of righteousness by faith, with the first and second angels message. So we have a message to give to the church to awaken them to their condition so that they can examine once again righteousness by faith. Offshoots and independent ministries proliferate. Financial scandals and heresies supply grist for the mills of the critics. Serious questions are raised about whether the Seventh-day Adventist church is destined to become another segment of Babylon. And this definitely, in the 1980s, was... Um, was happening. So before the internet, before people have, you know, all this social media, um, we used to get like cassettes where you might get little tracks from different groups, different offshoot, offshoots. Um, usually it was cassettes. So you'd listen to some kind of sermon of somebody 
ranting about the problems in the church and why the Seventh-day Adventist Church is Babylon. Um, I have one book here. It's called, um, let's see it here. Um, but it's it's basically a book about how the Seventh-day Adventist Church is Babylon. Can't think of the guy's name. Um, so these types of things I was reading in the 1980s <clears throat> and in the 90s and examining these things for myself. So, uh, so there's lots of people saying because of the condition of the church, the church is Babylon. Uh, the most precious message the Lord sent this people nearly a century ago contains the beginning of the solution to all these problems. It was a message of much more abounding grace. Our increasing perplexities are the direct result, certain harvest of an unbelief past and current of that 1888 message. When truth is refused, error always rushes in to fill the vacuum, but no problem is too great to be rectified through repentance. Now we have taken the position that the reason the 1888 message was rejected is because the first two were rejected. And the idea here that you see throughout the 80s and 90s is if we can just study the third angel's message, then Christ can come back. But we know that you can't have a third without a first and second. So they don't know this yet. In, eight, in 1988, we have not come to the time of the end for this generation. Right? We haven't come to the repeat of Millerite history yet. In that period of time, from 1888, from the start of the second generation of Adventism, through to 1919, the time of the third generation starts there. And then 1957, the fourth generation. This 1888 message has been rejected, <clears throat> set aside, reinterpreted, and then um, this counterfeit has been repackaged, and the result is what you see happening in 1988, the condition of the church. So God then is not going to just give the third angel's message. He's going to give the first angel's message. It's going to be repeated. And the second angel's message in, nine, in 2001 at 9-11 is then going to be repeated. But they don't know this in 1988. But they do know that there is a problem. And so their solution is, is not really going to be the correct solution, even if they had the correct message, which I don't believe that they did. I don't believe Jones or, or Whelan in short had the, the, the message that Jones and Wagner presented. And we're going to look at that. So the thing is, there is lots in this book that is good. And this book isn't really about what the message was. It's going to be more about the history of what happened, which is important to understand from our point of view, because not only are we repeating the history of the Millerite movement, but we're repeating the history of the Adventist church as well. And we've seen that. We've seen that uh, the rejection of the first, second, and third angels' messages parallel um, um, our history. So uh, when truth is refused, errors always rushes into fill back. So this, we can see that this is the case. But it's also the case with the 1888 message as presented by Wieland and Short, and especially people like Jack Sekira. But also as the church adapts its language so that it can appear that we are preaching righteousness by faith when we're not. Now, there are, have been people in this movement who have, at times, come up with it. We need the message, the third angel's message of righteousness by faith, that we don't preach it enough. And that probably is true. But what they present as the third angel's message is not the third angel's message. We've seen people present where... Uh, you know, the third angel's message is some kind of perfectionism where, you know, if we just, yep, Kelly, did you have a comment? I hear your voice there. What's that? Never mind. Okay. Okay. So, um, 
So we see people presenting things that are really what I would call legalism. So they think that legalism, that if we solve the symptom of sin, that is, if we address all of our little sins, then, then we're going to perfect a Christian character. In Jones, what we've read in Jones, 1893 and 1895 General Conference Bulletin, especially the latter, um, it's quite clear that no righteousness, no righteousness comes from us at all. Now, it is true that God wants us not to be committing little sins, but we can, we can deceive ourselves because we meet some standard of righteousness that we have set that is a human standard. And it can be how we dress, what we eat, um, what we watch. And we can meet all of these conditions, but not have true love for one another. It was we can be gossips. We can be judging others because they're not as good as us. And we can be cutting them off. We can be mocking them, criticizing, doing all these things that were done in 1888 against Jones and Wagner and not even recognize that um, we are not righteous. So we can, we can set up a standard of righteousness that humans can meet, but it's not the standard that God has set because that's higher than any human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. For us to reach that standard of righteousness has to be a miracle. It has to be something where Christ is in us. His righteousness dwells in us. And so often what we see is a type of perfectionism presented as righteousness by faith. We know that God is going to produce in us a perfect character. But the question is, how is that done? What is it that we see? What is our focus? <clears throat> okay, so um, so when he, so when he says here in this sentence, um, okay, I'm just going to read this paragraph. The most precious message the Lord sent his people nearly a century ago contains the beginning, right? So he believes that that's beginning, but the beginning is the first angel's message, right? Not, not the third angel's message. This most precious message was sent to, to God's people. But in order for it to be the solution to all these problems, we need also the first and second. So it was a message of much more abounding grace. Our increasing perplexities are the direct result of certain harvest of an unbelief past, current, past and current of that 1888 message. But we would say that would also be an unbelief of the first and second angels. Messages. When truth is refused, error always rushes in to fill the vacuum, but no problem is too great to be rectified through repentance. This last one is, is a key to understanding Joan, uh, Wieland and Short's book because they believe in a thing called corporate repentance. They believe that the church must repent of the rejection of the 1888 message in order for Christ to return. That This is sort of a necessary uh, prerequisite in order for this message to do its work. Without further delay, the world church must know the full story of our century-old confrontation with Christ. Ellen White often likened our 1888 default to the Jews' rejection of him two millennia ago. This book will re-examine her letters and manuscripts, as well as published statements. She must be allowed to speak frankly without inhibition. When the full truth is comprehended, whether these authors can tell it clearly enough, or whether other authors yet to come must succeed better, repentance and reformation will take place, and the people will be prepared for the coming of the Lord. The Laodicean message will not fail but will result in healing and restoration. Ellen White's confidence is neatly summed up in a brief word written by her son shortly before her death. I told Mrs. Lydda Scott how mother regarded the experience of the remnant church and of her positive teaching that God would not permit this denomination to so fully apostatize that there would be a coming out of another church. This statement implies that there would indeed be very serious apostasy, but the Lord would not permit it to become total. Until her death, she cherished the conviction 
that denominational repentance would eventually come. So this is really the premise of this book. Now, is this true what uh, uh, Willie White says about what Ellen White has said, what his mom has said? Is it true that the church would not um, fully apostatize? God would not permit this. Do we find this in Ellen White's writings? If we found it in Ellen White's writings, wouldn't he have just used a quote from Ellen White's writings to state this? The church shall appear as about to fall, but it won't. won't. Yes. So when we know when we're talking about the church, we can't be talking about the organization. And why is that? If a Sunday law comes and the church supports the Sunday law, will the church have fallen? Will it, it be the Seventh-day Adventist church? We'd have to say no, right? It wouldn't be it the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, now, what about if the church stood for the Sabbath as an organization? Would that, would the Seventh-day Adventist Church still exist? The church is the people, that the, the part that will fall is the structure of the church. We know that all the properties will be taken right. away and all right. created and so on. So what people think of as the church, when they take that statement, the church will appear about to fall, but it will not fall. Obviously, she's not talking about the institutions of the church. She's talking about the church as a people. And then she says, the sinners in Zion will be sifted out. She also says, company after company or, or uh, will leave us, but tribe after tribe will join us, or is it the other way around? I can never remember. Um, I think the idea is that smaller groups leave us and larger groups join us. So the tribe after tribe joins us. Um, so we know that the church, it's the movement of Seventh-day Adventism that survives. The organization, the structure, the institutions are not going to survive. Now, Wheeland in short, their whole belief is that the denomination will repent. Right? Because they say until her death, she cherished the conviction that denominational repentance would eventually come. And I don't see anything in her writings that say that. Actually, quite the contrary. So we know that the church is that we're not going to have any earthly support. We're not going to have a denominational structure to support us as we go through uh, the time of trouble, as we go through the events that are going to unfold. So what we need to understand is the message. We can't, we can't depend upon the church, but we also can't depend upon our organizations. We're not calling people out of the Seventh-day Adventist church into some new organization. This is what Parminder and Tabo and Marco and others believe that needed to happen. And we don't believe that that's the case, that we don't form a new organization to call people out of. That would be a sign that, that this movement is dead. We recognize that we are Seventh-day Adventists and we have a message to give to Seventh-day Adventists. We're not forming a new church. We're not saying that Seventh-day Adventist Church is Babylon, that we need to come out of it, that if you're a member in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you're going to be lost. I'm not saying anything like that whatsoever. Our work is to our brethren and sisters in the church. We also have the work to do of people around us, whoever will receive the truth. But this movement has a message to give to Seventh-day Adventists. And 
that message includes the third angel's message, but it also uh, requires that the first and second angel's messages be understood and experienced. Because the third angel's message, my view is that you can believe the third angel's message, but without the prophetic foundation, you have no power or conviction. And we see that really what has eroded um, Adventism has been the fact that they've not been able to intellectually support their understanding of the 2300 days, the 70 weeks. They've abandoned these things as untenable, chronologically speaking. And so God has given us a, us a message to show the truth of these prophecies. And that has to be established. Now, and it's not just an intellectual understanding. Of them. It's an experiential understanding of them, right? So that is, this movement is passing through that history. Seventh-day Adventists are passing through a repeat of that history, those that have accepted this message. And it's that that strengthen our, strengthens our faith and trust in God. So, you know, just understanding how the chronology works is not enough. There is an experience that we are going through. It is showing us our true condition. We know that righteousness by faith is contained within the first and second angel's messages, not just the third. But the third angel's message shows that completed work of Christ. When it has done its work, Christ's character will be perfectly reproduced in his people. And then he shall come to take them as his own. Now, when we look at this next part here, this is uh, going to be their outline of what the 1888 message was. So he says here, this book is not intended to reproduce the message itself. Several other works prepared by the authors attempt to do this, but for those who do not have access to these publications or to original sources, we list in a very brief form a resume of the unique essential elements of that message. Readers will recognize that these concepts are in contrast to ideas generally or officially held by our people today. Documentation is available in the books cited in the footnote. So the first thing, Christ's sacrifice is not merely provisional, but effective for the whole world, so that the only reason anybody can be lost is that he has chosen to resist the saving grace of God. For those who are saved at last, it is God who has taken the initiative. In the case of those who are lost, uh, so for, for those that are saved at last, it is God who has taken the initiative. In the case of those who are lost, it is they who took the initiative. Salvation is by faith. Condemnation is by unbelief. Now, I have a great deal of difficulty with this statement. First, do we see this concept in the writings of Jones and Wagner? Now, of course, he's doing a summary in sort of a technical language, right? So he's talking about provisional and effective. So if I look up this word, uh, these words or these phrases, um, you're not going to find that Jones and Wagner talk about uh, Christ's sacrifice um, as being provisional or anything about uh, provisional, right? So provisional or effective. You're just not going to see any of these terms used. So one of the things that I would do if I'm going to say somebody taught something and I'm going to, I'm going to put it in their words, not in some way in which I have analyzed those words, right? So I don't think you find this idea um, discussed in Jones and Wagner. Right? They're not going to really talk about this, this idea. 
and and even this idea of taking the initiative and so forth you know it's easier to be to, to be saved than it is to be lost that those types of ideas those are what i would call um uh what's the word i can't think of it um you know it's, it's sort of a pop theology right it sounds good but what does what does the bible say is the road to life wide and there are few that find it and the road to to death narrow and many go thereby is that what the bible says what does the bible say does the bible say it's easy to be saved and it's hard to be lost No, it says it's hard to be saved. Narrow is the way, straight is the gate. That's right. rigorous and tough. Yeah, so if it was true that it's it's easy to be saved and it's hard to be lost, then then the way to life would be wide. There would just be very few people that take it. So we know that the way to life is a narrow gate. It has a cross. It is hard to be saved but that's that's not you know that's not popular people like the idea well you know if you're lost you know you just that was the easy path to be saved so when you're lost it's it's all just your fault right you know you you have this huge opportunity but it is a difficult thing to be saved we have to understand what what salvation costs, what it costs for Christ and what it costs for us. It's the giving up of everything, the death to self. And that's not an easy thing. That's not something that we can just easily do. Now, it's true. Salvation is by faith. Right? We are saved by grace through faith that, that we need to trust. And it is true that people are condemned because of their unbelief. But it doesn't follow then from what was just said in, in the previous sentences. Now, the next uh, point is that Christ's sacrifice has legally justified every man. Well, you won't find any comments in Jones and Wagner about legal justification. So, so if this is a message of Jones and Wagner, if it, just like when we looked at what um, Froome said, about Jones and Wagner's message. We can see that Froome distorted what Jones was, and particularly we looked at Wagner, what Wagner was saying in his book, uh, The Righteousness of Christ, right? Or Christ and his righteousness, Christ our righteousness, whichever version of the book you read, um, that he distorted what was being said, that he distorted the 1888 message, and he said, here is the essence of the message. But it's not something that, that is the essence of the message. And here again, we have something. This is supposed to be the essence of their message, and yet they never address it. <clears throat> so they say, thus Christ has sacrificed, has legally justified every man. So they say thus. So that comes from their first point. And has literally saved the world from premature destruction. All men owe even their physical life to him, whether or not they believe, which is true. Every loaf of bread is stamped with his cross. When the sinner hears and believes the pure gospel, he is justified by faith, right? The lost delibery, deliberately negate the justification Christ has already effected for them. So what they want is justification for every man. Now, they, they want this to be a legal justification, and then that that justification, that legal justification, only applies once a person accepts it by faith. Now, there is sort of a partial truth to it. We know that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and that Christ died for every man, right? That every man might be saved. But there's no idea of this legal justification in the scriptures or in Jones and Wagner. 
or in the spirit of prophecy. So why does this legal justification come in? Where does this come from? Why are they even discussing it? Anybody have any ideas of why? So you won't see it talked about in Ellen White. You won't see it in the Bible. You won't see it in the spirit of prophecy. So where does it come from? Legal justification. Anybody know? A.G. Daniels must have been tossed around during that time that they were addressing it. Well, it comes a lot longer before then, right? Um, Desmond Ford and people like Desmond Ford. Okay, well, they're they're picking up on it. So, uh, but it starts long before. Catholicism, I would say Catholicism. Okay, well, <clears throat> it's a Lutheran idea. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So it's, it's sometimes referred to as forensic justification, a vo divine verdict of acquittal pronounced on the believing sinner. God declares the sinner to be not guilty because Christ has taken his place, living a perfect life according to God's law and sufferings of his sin. So that's from Wikipedia, right? Um, now, it also leads to legal universal justification that all men are justified, right? Um, so I'm, I'm just looking at some articles here. Uh, so this, this is going to get I'm going to start going down a rabbit hole if I read too many other things. So, so the idea here, I'm just going to read this. So this is um, by Angel Manuel Rodriguez. Um, so he's going to say, legal universal justification separates God's justifying act from the reception of the gift of the spirit or the new birth. Legal universal justification is totally objective act that does not make any difference in the life of the individual until he or she is justified by faith. That is to say, when the person decides not to reject the gift of justification that is already his or hers. Therefore, those who have been legally justified, the whole human race, have not been baptized by the sanctifying presence of the Spirit in their lives. They know nothing about the new birth. In the Bible, the legal declaration of justification is followed by the reception of the Spirit in the new birth. It is impossible to separate the two, even though we do not equate them. Legal universal justification does not only separate them, but in some cases, the second event, the baptism of the Spirit, never takes place because some reject the gift of legal justification. So he makes a good point. So this is just, uh, I don't know if you know anybody who knows who this is. He's an Adventist theologian. Um, so he, he's making some good points. And so the problem is legal justification occurs when the sinner accepts salvation and only then. That there isn't this blanket legal justification that justifies every man. Right? That, 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 that it is declared once a person accepts salvation on their behalf so he goes on this is manuel rodriguez he says legal universal justification implies that all human beings come into the world legally saved pardoned and justified from god's perspective they are not lost if it is true that every human being who has been and will be born in this planet was present in christ when he died and that they were all legally justified then those who are not born yet have already been justified the Bible makes clear that everyone who is born into this world of sin is in need of the Savior. We are by nature children of wrath. We deserve to die. It is true that because of Christ, we do not have to die. But that does not mean that we have already were already legally saved or justified before or when we were born. Now, we were reading in Jones, and he clearly makes this point that only by faith are we in Christ. 
right? That is, you have to be in Christ. Once you're in Christ, you're justified. But if you're not in Christ, you're not justified. But Wieland and Short here are saying that we're legally justified even if we're not in Christ. So you can see the problem. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so this this is the problem. This is, they were teaching something that the Bible, Spirit of Prophecy, and Jones and Wagner never taught. And actually quite the contrary. So, so this is a problem. When it comes to the 1888 message, and people look to the 1888 message study committee, especially in the 80s and 90s, people are getting confused. Now, they published Jones and Wagner's books, but obviously they're not understanding what Jones and Wagner are teaching. <clears throat> so then he goes on to say justification. So this, we're going back to the point three. A justification by faith is therefore. Um, much more than a legal declar declaration or acquittal. So he's making this distinction, which I don't believe exists in the Bible. That is, when you have justified justification by faith, that's when you have a legal declaration, right? That, that occurs together. But he says, therefore, much more than a legal declaration of acquittal, it changes the heart. Now, we know, of course, that is true. But in order to have this legal declaration of acquittal, it comes with the changing of the heart. The sinner has now received the atonement, which is reconciliation with God, since it is impossible to be truly reconciled to him and not also, and not also be reconciled to his holy law. It follows that true justification by faith makes the believer to become more obedient to all the commandments of God. And that would be true. The problem is that you cannot possibly have legal justification without reconciliation. The two have to go hand in hand. Now, this opens up the door to some other errors that we're going to, to go into at, when we look at Jack Sakira's book um, uh, called Beyond Belief. And then their fourth point, this marvelous work is accomplished through the ministry of the new covenant, wherein the Lord actually writes his law in the heart of the believer. Obedience is loved. Um, and the new motivation transfer, transcends fear of being lost or hope of reward in being saved. Either of those motivations is what Paul means by his phrase, under the law. The old and new covenants are not matters of time, but of condition. Abraham's faith enabled him to live under the new covenant, while multitudes of Christians today live under the old covenant because self-centered concern is their motivation. The old covenant was the promise of the people to be faithful. Under the new covenant, salvation comes by believing God's promises to us, not by making our making promises to him. Now, this is mostly true, what he's saying here. Um, and, but here they're dealing with this idea of motivation, right? So they say there's, there's two different motivations that are not good. The fear of being lost or the hope of reward. Now, is it true that those motivations are what it means to be under the law? Is that what Paul means by his phrase under the law? That you're you're either being uh, motivated by the fear of being lost or the hope of being saved. What does it mean to be under the law? According to the Bible, according to well, Jones. I thought if you're living in sin, you're under the law. Oh, well, that would be true, but it means to be under the condemnation of the law. Yeah, right. Now, are all men under the condemnation of the law? Uh, 
I would say yes. Yes. Okay. Now, are we born under the condemnation of the law? Yeah, we're born, we're born, born, into, born into sin. Yeah. Was Christ we're not born, born under the law because? Yeah. Okay. I would say we're not born under the law because sin is transgression of the law. Okay. But it's but to be under the law to, it means to be under to have, his condemnation. So uh, you have to not, have a knowledge. You have to have a knowledge of the law in order to in order to um, be under condemnation of the law, don't you? Okay. Well, let's look at some scriptures here. Um, because this this it comes up. We're going to go through this when we go through the two books on Galatians. Um. But particularly what we want to look at uh, is um, Galatians chapter 4. And I'll just get rid of the Greek. We don't need that here. Uh, Greek numbers. Now I say that an heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions, adoption of sons. So was Christ made under the condemnation of the law by being made of a woman? Is that what this verse is saying? The question is, was Christ under the law? Became sin for us. So what, what is generally understood is that when Christ was made under the law, that just means he was he was a Jew, right? That that's how that's how people would take it. I'm just trying to say it in the simplest way. That he was made under law. That means he had to keep the laws that the Jews kept. And But then he came to redeem them that were under the law. Well, wouldn't that just be the Jew that he came to redeem? Jones and Wagner clearly teach that when Christ was made of a woman, he was, we could say that he was born of a woman, born under the law. Christ was born condemned that is he had a nature that was under the law so if we think about this idea the idea of eternal um, or of universal justification legal justification the bible says quite the opposite instead of us being born um being legally justified it's quite clear that when we are born, we are legally condemned. We're under the condemnation of the law. And that when Jesus came, he was made of a woman, made under the condemnation of the law. He was made to be a man. He had this, that means he was subject to death, right? So all of us are born under the law. And Christ was also born under the law because he came to save those that are condemned. That is the whole reason he saves us. So you can see that the problem that you have, once you believe in legal justification, it totally undermines this whole idea of the nature of Christ, what his nature was, that he felt as a sinner, even though he never sinned. Because he has he had a nature that was condemned. Okay. <clears throat> so we can see this suggestion here, which is something completely foreign to Jones and Wagner's writings, uh, that the, under the law means to be to be caught in these one of these two motivations. It's definitely not what. Paul is saying, you don't see it anywhere in Paul's writings. And, and nowhere does the Bible uh, tell us that we, we shouldn't be motivated by 
fear of being lost or that we shouldn't be motivated by hope of reward in being saved. Because both of those things are being presented throughout the Bible as motives. Choose life. Why should you die? Right? You have before you life and death. Choose life. You don't want to die. That's a motive of not to suffer the condemnation of death. And you have the opportunity, the hope of life. Choose it. That is, both are valid motivations for us to choose to follow God. Now, are they sufficient in and of themselves without understanding the character of God? No. We need to know God's character. We need to understand him. We need to know him. But those, those motivations are still to be there. That's how God first approaches us. So what we had in the 80s and 90s and, and through to this time is we just talk about God's love. So we talk about his love. His love is what's going to motivate us. Well, it doesn't work. Because we need something to bring a power and a conviction to our lives. To trust God. We can talk about his love, but we need to see it through experience and through his word. That's what's been given to us. And if you just talk about God's love, what you get is some of these extremes the character of God movement in Adventism. That's sort of the logical result of God's character, of talking about love. So God doesn't really kill, right? Because if we present to God that he's going to destroy sinners, well, that distorts God's character. So the God does not kill movement is a result of this distortion of the gospel. <clears throat> Um, the Old and New Covenants are not matters of time, but of condition. And well, that, that would be true. So um, Abraham's faith enabled him to live under the New Covenant, while multitudes of tradition, Christians today live under the Old Covenant. Because of self-concern, because self-concern is their motivation. So you can see, is that the reason that multitudes of Christians today live under the Old Covenant? Because self-concern is their motivation? Right? You, can, you can start to see the problems with these ideas. They sound good on the surface. Now, it's true that only self-concern isn't going to be your ultimate motivation for everything that you do. But self-concern is presented in the Bible regarding your salvation. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Right? We know that it's God's work. But to somehow say that the motivation of fear or the hope of reward as a motivation is somehow the old covenant. That's not what's presented in the Bible. Now it is true. The old covenant was the promise of the people to be faithful. So that was based upon man's promises. And the new covenant is based upon God's promises. Right? So that is true. But you can see you mix a little bit of error in. It distorts the value of the truth that's in the message. Now he goes on, um, another point. God's love is active, not merely passive. As good shepherd, Christ is actively seeking the lost sheep. Right, so we know that Christ came to die for sinners. So this is a truth. But then he says, our salvation does not depend on our seeking the Savior, but on our believing that he is seeking us. So again, this is more to pop theology. Are we to seek God? According to the scriptures. 
Because if we believe that what well, God is active and not merely passive, and that he is our shepherd, you know, seeking us, well, we don't really need to seek God. We just need to believe that he is seeking us. Again, this makes us passive, correct? Abiding in Christ. Oh. Yeah. Right. So, so do we have, what this does is it continues to take away the active part of the Christian life, right? And it puts everything into just this sort of nebulous type of belief. You know, there, there's so many Bible verses dealing with this. Um, you should seek the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Right. Um, there's just so many times we can find in the Bible, seek the Lord. Seek him right. as, as you were see, as you were searching for gold. Yeah, I mean, there's all the parables of Christ. So, so this idea, this passive idea, just because God is active, it doesn't mean that we're passive. Look at the prodigal son. That prodigal son has to take the action to go to his father's house, right? Now, his father's longing for him to come back and runs to him when he sees him in the field. So we know what God's heart is towards us and that his character draws us. But in the story of the prodigal son, does the father go and find him in this, uh, you know, feeding the, the pigs, um, uh, you know, pods, the husks? No. So the sinner has to respond. We have to seek God. So he says, those who are lost at last continue to resist and despise the drawing of his love. This is the essence of unbelief. So these things have a sense of being true because there is truth in them. But they distort it by an overemphasis upon. Um, and, and, and we don't see this in Jones and Wagner because he talks all about this. Right. All of these things. We just read them in the 1895 General Conference Bulletin about how we have no righteousness in and of ourselves and, and what God is doing to save us. We, we can resist and despise his drawing of his love. But that's not all that happens. So then he says, thus, it is difficult to be lost and easy to be saved. If one understands and believes how good the good news is, right? So, of course, he puts this qualifier. Like, if we understand this, then, you know, it, it's going to be hard to be lost. But I don't think that that's the case. I still think it's harder to be saved. Sin is a constant resisting of his grace since... Um, now, that, that's kind of an interesting sentence. Okay. And sin is the transgression of the law. And we know that his law is, is a transcript of his character. Right? Um, so I don't know about that sentence. I'm not sure what's behind it. So he, but he puts it in there. And so sometimes when people write a sentence and it just doesn't seem to be logically flowing from what he's saying, at least it I don't see. Well, it doesn't seem complete. Yeah, there's something hidden in there that I'm, I'm not sure. But let's read on. Since Christ has already paid the penalty for every man's sin, the only reason anyone can be condemned at last is continued unbelief, a refusal to appreciate the redemptive, Redemption achieved by Christ on his cross and ministered by him as high priest. The true gospel unveils this unbelief and leads to an effective repentance that prepares the believer for the return of Christ. 
Human pride and praise and flattery of human beings is inconsistent with true faith in Christ, but it is a sure sign of prevailing unbelief, even within the church. Um, okay, so let's go back to the sentence. If one understands and believes how good the good news is. Now, in there, he has understands and believes. Now, let's say God could present the gospel to every man in its fullness. And he could understand what the good news was. Would it be easy to be saved or be lost? Which would be easier? So if God just could give us the understanding of it, just magically make everyone understand the whole purpose of the gospel. Would it, it make people, way more people saved than lost? Because it would be easier to be saved than to be lost. Now we would say, well, he has here beliefs, right? But let's just take the beliefs out for now. So if everyone understood the gospel, God could make that understood to every man and give him the choice today. Would most people be saved? And only some be lost. I doubt it because man is so perverse and so depraved, he'll choose his own way above God's. Okay. So if it was true that most would be saved, then would not God have done that? Right? Would not God then have? just presented the gospel to every man all the time and say, here's your opportunity. You can understand the whole plan of salvation of the gospel. And then we would see that most people would be saved, right? If that was true, just understanding was sufficient, right? And so we can know that that's not all there is to it. Understanding is not sufficient. Now, what about beliefs? So if one understands so if everyone understood it, well, now you have this part of beliefs. So who is the beliefs? Who is the belief dependent upon? What is dependent upon somebody believing? So if God presented it to every man, we wouldn't say that every man would necessarily believe, right? Now, this is, it doesn't mean intellectual assent, that they may not want what God is offering. They may not believe it. They may not trust God. They may say, well, who is this guy who's, you know, telling me all these things? And what does he want from me, really? And you could see that belief in that context wouldn't really mean anything. Because belief in this context would be trust, would it not? And how do I come to trust someone? Well, you have to know people and you develop the trust. Okay. And for me to know God, the way that's being presented in the Bible, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Right? I don't know if I got it in the right order. But if we are to come to know God, if we are to have faith and trust, saving faith, it requires an experience. It, it requires us to receive light and respond to light. Now, none of us, when we receive light, are given all of the understanding of the gospel. Right? Light shines in the darkness, and it reaches us who are in darkness to try to touch something to see something that we can then see that we are a sinner and we we want to hide from that light we don't want to approach that light because we're under condemnation now light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light right so even if god could give us all the understanding we love darkness more than we love light we wouldn't be able to bear what God would show us. So in order for the gospel 
in order for God to save us through the gospel, we have to go through life. We have to experience life. We have to stumble and fall. We have to see our need of Christ. Truth has to come to us. Christ's char character has to be revealed through people, through nature. And then we either respond to that and God can give us more light. And then he can take our sins from us. Or we can, we can reject that light and hold on to our sins. And God isn't just there to condemn us because he's there to save us. And all of us have these sins. All of us have this darkness that we love because it hides something about us that we don't love about ourselves. So we love darkness because we have these sins that we know are unloving. And so we hide from the truth. We, we pretend to be Christians. We do all kinds of things to cover up the reality of who we are. Superficial. Yes. So, so the idea that it's difficult to be lost and he's easy to be saved, if one understands and believes how good the good news is, the point is to understand and believe that you can't just say, you can't just put that in there. It is difficult to be lost. Or, or to be saved, and it is easy to be lost. But Christ is doing everything he can, the difficult thing, and we have to do the diff difficult thing as we cooperate with Christ. So, so there's truth mixed with error again in these statements. And that's because they're following from a false premise that Christ has died and legally justified every man, that every man forensic justification is for all men. Now in seeking lost mankind, Christ came all the way taking upon himself and assuming the fallen sinful nature of man after the fall, which we would agree. This he did that he might be tempted in all points like as we are, yet demonstrate perfect righteousness in the likeness of sinful flesh, which we would agree. The 1888 message accepts likeness to mean what it says, not unlikeness. Righteousness is a word never applied to Adam in his unfallen state, nor to sinless angels. It can only connote a holiness that has come into conflict with sin in fallen human flesh and triumphed over it. Thus the message of Christ's righteousness that Ellen White endorsed so enthusiastically in the 1888 era is rooted in this unique view of the nature of Christ, if he had taken the sinless nature of Adam before the fall, the term Christ's righteousness would be a meaningless abstraction. The 1888 messengers recognized the teaching that Christ took only the sinless nature of Adam before the fall um, to be the legacy of Romanism, right? So the idea that Christ took the nature of Adam before the fall is, is Catholic. The insignia of the mystery of iniquity, which keeps him afar off and not nigh at hand. Now, thus, so this part is really, to me, it's part of the same idea. Um, <clears throat> thus, our Savior condemns sin in the flesh of fallen mankind. This means that he has outlawed sin. Sin has become unnecessary in the light of his ministry. It is impossible to have true New Testament faith in Christ. And continue in sin. We cannot excuse continued sinning by saying we are only human or that the devil made me do it. In the light of the cross, the devil cannot force anyone to sin. To be truly human is to be Christ-like in character, for he was and is fully human as well as divine. So in here, there's some, there's some problems. He's not necessarily, I, I can't say that what he said here has is full of error, but there is something behind it that is not evident. Now, if we know that Christ came and was made under the law, made under the condemnation of the law, that he might redeem those that are under the condemnation of the law, we know it can't be true that man is not under the condemnation of the law legally. Man has to be under the condemnation of the law. 
not just before Christ came, but after, right? So we're, we're born under the law. And Christ was born under the law. <laughs> but when they deal with the nature of Christ, they focus on one aspect of it. That is, Christ was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And that's true. So Christ came in the nature of Adam after Adam had fallen. Right? He came in a fallen human nature, a sinful nature. And Jones is clear on that. But we know that um, he didn't feel as sinless in his character. He felt as a man, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't have said it that way. So we'll say he felt as a man all that all of us feel. He felt condemned. He felt guilty. Now, what you'll see is there's this discussion within conservative Adventists that Christ did not inherit human guilt. Right? So they'll say that, well, Christ was not born guilty. That you can't be born guilty. But if you're born in a, in a nature that's condemned, that nature is by definition guilty. So Christ took upon on himself a nature that was under the condemnation of the law. He felt guilt and the condemnation of the law his whole lifetime. Jones is very clear on that in the consecrated way to Christian perfection. You read that book. He's quite clear about it. But yet that idea is rejected by this movement, the 1888 Message Study Committee, the Righteousness by Faith movement, as something that is Catholic. So they're not going to accept the idea that we are born uh, under the condemnation of law or that Christ was born under the condemnation of the law as being part of his being human, even though it's clearly marked in Jones and Wagner. So it follows that the only element God's people need in order to prepare for Christ's return is that genuine New Testament faith. But that is precisely what the church lacks. She imagines herself to be doctrinally and experientially rich and increased with goods, when in fact her root sin is a pathetic unbelief. Righteousness by, is by faith. It is impossible to have faith and not demonstrate the righteousness in the life, because true faith works by love. Moral and spiritual failures are the fruit of perpetuating Israel's ancient, ancient sin of unbelief today through the confusion of a false righteousness by faith. Uh, righteousness by faith since 1844 is the third angel's message in verity. So again, they're going to say the third angel's message is righteousness by faith, not understanding what she, Ellen White means by in verity. That is, the first angel's message and the second angel's message is are part of the everlasting gospel. Is the everlasting gospel the message of righteousness by faith? We would have to say yes. Righteousness by faith is just a shortcut way of talking about the everlasting gospel. It's just an expression of it. So if it's true that the first and second angel's message are part of the everlasting gospel, then they also are part of the experience of righteousness by faith. Now, when we talk about faith, we know that this is not just talking about mere belief from an intellectual point of view. But it's, it's an act of faith. It's, it's a trust and a dependence upon God. And we can see why the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. That as we go through, as we receive the gospel, it occurs in this pattern, right? Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Other different ways in which it can be expressed. First, second, and third angel's message. Millerite history. Um, so this pattern in which God gives us light. And we can see in, um, in um, uh, early writings, we have the, the two different illustrations that Ellen White gives of the first and second angel's messages in Millerite history. And that it's a response to light. So the idea of righteousness by faith since 1844 is the third angel's message in verity. Thus, it is greater than what the reformers taught and the popular churches understand today. It is a message of unbounding grace consistent with the unique Adventist truth of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary 
were contingent on the full cleansing of the hearts of God's people on earth. And then he says, there are other aspects of the 1880 message, such as reforms in health and educational methods, but our principal concern in this book is its heart, as recognized by Ellen White. Righteousness by faith. It is not true that the 1888 message was opposed to church organization. Um, so um, he's going to have this last little bit here. Uh, the 1888 history and message supply a key to reconciliation with the Lord Jesus. A great final atonement will become reality. There shall be a fountain opened to the house of David, the church leadership, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the organized church, for sin and for uncleanness. So this is what he believes. Uh, well, Whelan and Short believe. So they, the 1888 message study committee believes that the church is going to accept this message and be purified as an institution, institutional Adventism, right? The church not leadership, corporate. the organized church. What's that? You said it's not, not they say corporately? Yes. So they're going to talk about corporate repentance. So they believe that in order for Christ to return, for the Sunday law to come, that the church has to corporately repent. I don't right? believe that. No, I don't either. It, it It's definitely not something that we... We see in the Bible the spirit of prophecy, um, but that's what so that becomes their focus. So there's so we need to take that into account when we go through this history of 1888, that these views yeah. color what's happening. So just yeah. as those in the church who have have rejected the 1888 message, but say they accept it. Um, people like, you know, George R. Knight and Froom, right? Well, the church has accepted this message of 1888, but they have a completely different message. It's also true that the 1888 message study committee, who's promoting Jones and Wagner as presenting the truth, also have an incorrect view of righteousness by faith. And this was so influential in uh, the 1980s and 1990s for Seventh-day Adventists who, who lived through that history that it was very confusing. And one of the things that we just did not have was the power to overcome sin in our lives. We had rejected the everlasting gospel, even though we professed to talk about righteousness by faith. And you see this inheritance within this movement, people who are talking about righteousness by faith, Jones and Wagner's message, Righteousness by faith is the true is the third angel's message in verity, having no real understanding of what that message is. And we, we saw that with individuals pushing that all through the time of this movement. Jeff dealt with it over and over again. You know, people pushing what they thought was the third angel's message. And we need this third angel's message. We need this righteousness by faith. And it's true. We need it. But we have to have it in its place. We need to understand what it is. And we're not going to understand what it is without understanding our history. And I'm not talking about our history in an intellectual sense. I'm talking about experientially. We need to experience the gospel, the first, second, and third angels message. Jeff, you have a comment or not? Okay. I forgot. <laughs> Sorry. I forgot. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So, so, um, now, you can see this uh, uh, preface is written on June 3rd, 1987. So the, it's, uh, the book, I believe, came out in 88, but, you know, maybe it came out in 87, 488, so 1988. Um, but you can see prior to November 9th, 1989, this message, the third angel's message comes to the fore, but it comes in this distorted way. And so... When the first angel's message arrives, the fall of the Soviet Union, it's not even understood as what it is. Jeff is the one who understands it, right? So Jeff Pippinger is the chosen instrument that God has to understand this. And so Jeff is going to you know, study these line upon line. He's going to see this parallel of Millerite history and our history and begin to lay down these lines. But he, we're also going through that experience that the pioneers went through 
in Millerite history, both as, as a movement, but also as individuals. So, um, so that's where we're going to end today. Now, tomorrow, we have a Sabbath school in church. So in Mountain Standard Time. So wherever you are right now, it's 8.30 uh, p.m. here. So Mountain Standard, so that means it's going to be in... Um, it will be Pacific Time. What's that? That'll well, be 8, so, eight to 9 o'clock Pacific Time. Uh, yeah, so so it'd be nine o'clock Pacific time. Um, well, yeah, Central time it would be uh, noon, and so we're gonna have a Sabbath school from ten to eleven. My time. Now, Dwight, Dwight does Dwight uh, uh, yeah, sure. does his uh, nine o'clock. He's gonna do his at uh, yeah, so nine o'clock Pacific time. Yeah, so we're not gonna have this the six thirty or seven thirty in the morning one. On Sabbath okay. morning, we're going to have it early. We're sounds, going to have it here. Sounds good. Right, <laughs> in, instead of doing so, it now. So, so in the east, it would be like 12 o'clock. Yeah, it'll be noon there. And and yeah. it's going to be uh, in East Africa. It's going to be uh, 8 p.m. Because right? they're 10 hours difference than me. So like right now, it's, it's 8.31. Um, so... Um, so it would be uh, what time? Eight. Ten thirty here. It's like six thirty or something in the morning in East Africa, I think. All right. So they're going to have to wait until, um, you know, for them it'll be nighttime when we have that, and then and then at eleven o'clock I'm going to do a sermon. Now I won't always be the one doing the sermon. Different people might do the sermon, but I'll be doing it this this Sabbath. Um, so that would end up being at, um, so if they start at 8, 8 p.m., so 9 p.m., it would be 9 p.m. East, East Africa. Um, so so anyway, that's that's what's going to happen tomorrow. Now, uh, there are some people unhappy about it, that we're doing stuff when the Canadian American group are doing their studies, but it's just the way it is to accommodate other people. Have I said, I know you've tried to uh, tried to mingle, but it got to the point. It seems like it's not working. Yeah. No. So, so it's not. It's you know, we're not uh, trying to step on anybody's toes or anything like that. We're just simply uh, doing what's going to work best for us. So people have a choice where they where they want to go, where that what they want to. Uh, Watch. I mean, people can always watch them later anyway, because they record it. So, um, so that's what's going to happen tomorrow. And I, I'm going to deal with um, uh, a sermon that I did back in 2014. I'm going to present it again. It's, it's called Love, Part One. It, it is in my notes in my uh, on my academia site. I have the, the notes for it there. But I'm so going to present to a little bit different. What's that? Does that have to do with righteousness by faith? Yes, it has to do with righteousness by faith, and, and how I've how I've come to understand the gospel. So, so it's kind of a summation of my beliefs, and a lot of those things you would see in Jones and Wagner, what we read in the 1895 General Conference Bulletin. They're expressing ideas that Jones expressed, but in my own way of expressing it. So I'm going to go through that. Um, so any final thoughts before we close with prayer on, on this study? Well, not for me. Okay. Okay, well, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we, we are thankful for the truths of your word. And for the light that has come to us individually and to your church and to this movement. And we ask, Lord, that we can respond to that light, that the sins that hide in us, the darkness that we have used to, to hide from ourselves and from others, um, our shame. We pray, Lord, that we can allow that light in. 
that we can recognize that you love us and forgive us and have a purpose and a plan for us. We want to experience your salvation in our lives and we want to reveal your character to those around and draw each person to you. We ask, Lord, that you can bless people around the world who watch these studies, and the people in Africa who are, um, many will be joining us tomorrow. Uh, we just ask, Lord, that um, you can bless each of them. We pray that you can be with us in our personal study, that we can cling to you. Thank you, Lord, uh, again. For each person, may your angels watch over us. And may the Sabbath truly be a blessing, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.